All right, and welcome to Ibble Studios. Uh, we are here with episode three of Salami Get This Straight, where we take a look at the Austin food scene, the uh, the chefs, the food, the foodies, the food critics, and more importantly, the food, right? The food that's coming out of Austin. Um, we've got a very, very special guest here in episode three. We have Jason McVary from Poke Poke, uh, one of my favorite places, Jason. I'm so glad to have you on the show. So what's going on, my friend? It's well, so good to see you again. Yeah, it's good to see you too. And uh, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be on this new podcast with such a great punny name. Um, <laughs> very impressive. Uh, you know, we're in the summertime right now, which for us is our busy season because everybody wants something light and fresh. And um, so we're just really kind of in making sure everything's completely operational mode right now, which right. is, which is, uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, we kind of switch between, okay, now we're going to get into innovative mode when we're a little bit slower and we're going to fix problems and tackle some big issues, you know, and then we get to this mode and it's like, it's just keep the wheels on, make right. sure everything's going. And uh, so that's where we are and that's what we're doing, but enjoying, enjoying the summer, this incredibly hot summer. I know, right? It's My been God. crazy. Wow. How how has that impacted um like like because I know that you know fish doesn't you know doesn't stay fresh as long when it gets really really hot are you having any kind of like are you having any kind of issues with the heat uh, or with supply chain issues and things like that you know we we've had we have had some pretty serious supply chain issues in the last year year and a half. Uh, We've tended to overcome most of them, uh, you know, by either paring down the menu, mm -hmm. uh, taking things off that were just getting too hard to source. Um, and right now we're in an okay place. I mean, our fish cost has gone up incredibly in the last year and a half. So that's been an issue that we're just trying to manage through right now. Um, you know, just trying to manage waste and, uh, stay on top of exactly what we're ordering and just being more diligent about it. But um, on top of that, you know, we're really in a good place right now. I think we have finally stabilized in terms of all the supply chain stuff and, and whatnot, and uh, we're pushing through. In terms of the heat affecting us in those manner, it, the heat really doesn't affect us. I mean, all the product that we get is either on ice, super packed in ice, and we throw it in coolers, um, or it comes deep frozen, which, you know, most of the sushi that you get is, is going to be frozen. It has to be because most of the boats go out for two weeks at a time. And like you said, <laughs> fish, fish wouldn't be good after two weeks of just being not frozen. Um, but <laughs> what we worry about is AC, like yeah. all of the HVAC units right now, knock on wood are operating at optimal levels. It's the first for us but you know as the season goes on the hvac systems get really taxed and so uh that's that's our <laughs> that's our biggest concern just like everybody else in texas yeah you know it's like keep the keep the ac working and we're gonna be okay yeah yeah for sure yeah so jason you and i met a couple of years ago mm -hmm. and just completely randomly and um and you know i and it was so funny that I got I had an opportunity to be able to meet you because I was such a huge fan of the brand even before we met, right? Yep. So like, because I I discovered you like maybe like a year prior or so, and uh, I just I love I love the product. I mean, it, the product is fantastic. It's it's really authentic. It's super fresh, right? Um, and uh, you know, I had a chance to be able to talk to you about kind of like your history of you know, how you cat into the business, you mm -hmm. and your wife, and, uh, you know, how you guys discovered it. And it's a really interesting story that not a lot of people, I think, know. And so I wanted to make sure that we touch on that and 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 kind of talk about sure. how you guys kind of like fell in love with a product and, and, and decided to go into business for yourself making it, to share that with others. Sure, sure. I mean, it was, it's the most basic story. Um, you know, my wife said, this is a good idea. And so we did it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, uh, so I lived in Hawaii, uh, for about five years, um, in my late twenties, early thirties. And, um, at some point I, I had moved back to, to LA. I was working out of LA at the time, met my wife, 
you know, decided we're going to get married. We're in love. So I bring her out to Hawaii to meet all the buddies that I had spent the last five years with. And, you know, we're kind of a rough, kind of a rough around the edges crew, you know, a lot of partying, a lot of late twenties, just general shenanigans, plus being on an island, plus a boat, plus, you know, whatever. There's a lot of beer involved. And uh, so I took my, my wife out and she wasn't overly <laughs> impressed with our lifestyle, but she was super impressed with poke. You know, I mean, in the time where, you know, we're living in LA and, and eating sushi, you know, you eat sushi two nights a week. It's everywhere in Los Angeles. And we're on the plane ride back. And she's like, that was a great trip. You know, it was really interesting. I'm glad I met your friends, but you know, I'm sad we can't have any more poke, you know? I'm like, well, I can make it, you know? I'm sure I can. I, I didn't really make it a lot in Hawaii, but, I mean, I was just I just bought it, you know? I loved it. I ate it, you know, two, three times a week. Um, kind of took it for granted, I guess. And uh, so I told her we can make it. She said, wow, okay, cool. And then she said, we should open a poke place, just randomly. And uh, we both thought it was a <laughs> really good idea. Almost instantly, it was like, huh, yeah, you can't really get poke in Los Angeles. That's a really good idea. And um, so we got back. I started making poke. We started having parties and having our friends over to taste everything and and um, got kind of serious about it. She found a space on the Venice Boardwalk, which was a food window, one window of a multi-window building. So we were sharing a kitchen. Um, it's pretty low risk, you know, month to month, few grand a month, I think it was at the time, maybe two, 2,500, something like that. And so we just put everything into it and developed a brand pretty, pretty quickly, uh, together, developed a menu and, uh, just opened the doors and nobody came because nobody knew what poke was. And so it took a lot of work and just kind of a lot of hand wringing to get through those first six months. And we realized along the way that uh, we were wasting a lot of fish, making poke in the traditional style, uh, which is pre-made, you know, in a big third pan. We were wasting a lot of fish, so uh, we started making it to order, came up with this term, uh, flash marinade. You know, it's flash marinated, and uh, that just worked. We realized that making poke and flash marinating it uh, gave it all the same flavor characteristics, just about as if it was uh, marinated for three or four hours. So, because ahi takes on takes on flavor really well, um, and so we just move forward with this made to order process, adding ingredients and adding, you know, core recipes as we we're developing the product and getting more popular. And uh, you know, a year down the line, we had a line, you know, twenty people deep every day and it was just fascinating and we were thrilled and um you know then other poke places started popping up etc cetera, etc cetera. and then the made to order poke craze was born and that was what 11 years ago I wow th yeah i think it was uh 2010 so no 12 years ago <laughs> wow yeah that was 12 years ago so going into um you know, you're talking about like the actual process of flash marinating. Is sure. there like, how did you kind of like come up with that and how did, and what, and I mean, without giving too many trade secrets out. Right? Oh, but, you know, uh, we're not afraid to give out trade secrets, <laughs> quite frankly. I mean, you know, we're pretty open <clears throat> with giving people recipes and whatnot, but, um, cause you know, <laughs> opening a poke place is really, really difficult. So if you're going to yeah. compete with us because <laughs> we gave you a secret, then more kudos to you. But, um, so the, the flash marinating, quote, unquote, uh, process really revolves around, you know, hitting the fish or the protein first with salt, which I think is a pretty common uh, food. Um, you know, it's a kind of a rule to follow. You know, if you're marinating or seasoning something, you typically hit whatever you're seasoning with salt first. So with us, it was always you know, hit the fish with shoyu first. And everybody in our shop is trained to do that. That is the way that we make poke. And that opens the fish up uh, to, you know, the the sesame oil really is more of a, is more of, I don't, I don't want to say, it, it's more of like just a viscous element to keep everything uh, flowing with within the dish. And then all the other 
the additions that we put in it are, uh, you know, just kickers. You know, the onions absorb some sauce and some of the other elements do. And it's that that's that's about the as close to the secret as I can as I can like figure. Um, and of course, we don't use pre-made poke sauce. That's mm-hmm. that's a I think that's a no brainer, but should and should go without saying how did you come up with that like is it was it just kind of like a process of you just kind of like experimenting or trying to figure out like i know it's been a while but... it was really just applying the principle of salt first mm-hmm. um and and then knowing what the basis of the typical poke you know flavor profile is mm-hmm. right so we we figured out what that is and that's shoyu and sesame oil typically for us for other people it's different stuff ponzu and whatever um but we we had that that basic element and so then it's a it's a question of figuring out the the proportion you know is it one to one and it's changed over the years mm-hmm. um you know we used to be way more shoyu forward shoyu I mean soy sauce uh way more shoyu forward uh, but now it's almost a one-to-one ratio of shoyu to sesame oil, because mm-hmm. um, we have found that the sesame really is just a just a, such an essential element, and highlighting that more over the years has just uh, I think made sense to us, and it also uh, cuts down on you know your likelihood of oversalting something, which is which is something that we have to keep an eye on because mm-hmm. our shoyu is is a traditional Japanese shoyu it could be kind of overpowering so we have to really watch what we're doing yeah man I made the mistake of not eating before this interview because <laughs> my <laughs> and uh I hope uh I hope the mic's not picking up my stomach growling because like I'm so like this sounds so good uh I love uh, I love poke poke um that's awesome. so um one of the other things uh so and then poke, it, it you you shared the story of it how it originated, right? It used to be like Hawaiian snack, kind of like surfer food back in back in the day, right? Sure. I mean, how did, what's the what's the history behind it? Traditionally, and I'm not speaking to the long history behind it, but I can speak to the more recent history uh, of poke. Poke is a dish, you know, up until ten years ago, or maybe probably even five years ago, that you would find in a market. Right. I mean, you would find poke, there are pokes in in like a, what the equivalent here would be kind of a convenience store. There would be a poke counter, which is a deli case refrigerator with uh, pans of pre-made, pre-marinated poke, a few different flavors, what have you. And you just buy it by the pound and that's that. Um, You know, and I think Hawaiians have been making some version of poke probably for hundreds of years you know fish being one of the core elements of their diet you know them being out on boats probably for extended periods fishing i'm sure cutting up raw fish and salting it was a core piece of their diet for a very 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 long time and that's uh that's kind of worked its way into the more modern uh, variation where you see it in markets you know if you go to fish markets or there's markets that have just extended cases of poke. You know, the grocery store of Foodland is famous for their poke case. It is massive. Uh, there's so many pounds of poke in there. It's 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 glorious if you're a poke uh, you know, aficionado. Um, but yeah, it really evolved. And now you go back and the kind of made to order. You know, the way that we do our made to order process we still give you a product that looks like something you would get in Mm -hmm. Hawaii. You know, it's a cohesive product where the fish is at the forefront of whatever your, of of whatever recipe that you've chosen. It's fish with a couple things in it. And, you know, the sauce that we've made from scratch, that's all marinated in. And then it's this cohesive unit, Uh, you know, and then people have taken what we did and turned it into more of an assembly line thing, which, you know, more power to them. It's a very efficient way to operate. Their costs are much lower. Their training is like, you know, minimum. Uh, and they're given a product that, that I think people also enjoy. But that 
that product has now circled back to Hawaii. So now you will see kind of the modern California version of poke with the assembly line in Hawaii, mm. which is a little uh, a little jarring for us the first time we saw it. We were like, oh, oh no. You know, because we, we would, we make trips back as often as we can, usually once every two years. And a big element of those trips is always, you know, going to markets, um, you know, Alicia's market downtown, or I'll go to the same market that the Kaimuki market that I used to go to, the Tamuras, you know, and of course, Foodland and, and um, we go to these markets and, and taste the poke to make sure, you know, just to kind of ground ourselves to make sure we're still on the right path, you know, flavor profile wise with our business. Um, yeah. And, but now it's, it's uh, the poke landscape in Hawaii is changing, which is fascinating. That's cool. Hmm. So one of the, one of the main things that you guys kind of pride yourself on is, uh, you know, to that point is authenticity, right? Is when you walk in to your establishment, it kind of feels like you're walking into, you know, a surfside shop, right? Like it, sure. it, almost, it almost feels like you're walking in into a place that's not, a, you know, even though the food is like primo, it, it's still very grounded and kind of like surfside kind of like, I don't want to say not grungy, but kind of like something you would see, you know, in a shop on the, uh, you know, on the, on the, you know, near the boardwalk, right? Sure. Yeah. Yep. So, and so like <laughs> with some of the other products that you guys carry in, 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 in your, in your shop, like mm -hmm. how do you go about sourcing those, especially like the beers, the sodas, the, uh, the coconut waters, the all that kind of stuff. How do you go about sourcing that that stuff? Right. We're well. We're we're lucky here in Austin. There's a uh, local purveyor. They sell fish and uh, like Asian food specialty items. They're called Minamoto. Um, they actually supply most of the super high end fish that you see at Uchi and around town. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. They they're a super high end fish importer. We're lucky enough to get fish from them sometimes as well. Uh, occasionally you'll see big guy uh, from Hawaii or Fiji on special at one of our shops. Uh, we get that from Minamoto and uh, they're, they're just a really cool business uh, to work with. Um, but we, we've, they will source things for us from Hawaii, which is a fantastic. Like we get our Aloha shoyu, um, the Aloha drinks, uh, the beer, you know, we deal directly with some distributors here that specialize in more uh, specialty beers, but like Maui Brewing Company will carry kegs of Maui and cans of Maui, which is a fantastic uh, local brewery in Hawaii now. Uh, they, they just popped up probably five years ago and they're killing it and their beer is exceptional. I don't know, I don't know who's behind it money-wise, but it's a fantastic brand. Um, that porter. Oh, the porter, I know. It's so good. It's so good. It's like a coconut porter, right? Yeah. It's coconut porter. It and oh man. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you've this experienced is, it. I know. This is the worst. I'm so hungry. I know. Right and now. their big swell <laughs> sounds I know. so good right now. <laughs> and, and their big swell IPA is also exceptional. Yeah, um, yeah, that one's really good too. Yep. And uh and we were ta talking about Kona. We do have Kona. I mean, I've got so many memories of drinking Kona longboard lager. We would buy a keg. Um and it was really strong beer. <laughs> so we'd be we'd sip on a keg of Kona just for a few days, my buddies and I. And it was a, that was a fun few days. Um, but yeah, we're we're lucky. Our beach feel, our kind of you know, we don't come from restaurant backgrounds. So, and I'm mostly in charge of putting these stores together. And I will be honest, I am not the best when it comes to like visual detail, mm -hmm. you know? So if we could clutter a store up with cool surf stuff, I'm all about that, yeah. you know? Um, and that, that, that is our story. I mean, that was my life. I mean, I, I surfed in Hawaii for five years. It was amazing, you know? So if our stores feel a little bit like, you know, a surf shack or, you know, a little bit surf bummy, uh, that's because it's not really by design. It's just the only thing that, that we know. 
<laughs> but it works. Sense. That's sure. what's great. Like well, it's it part, works in Austin. It's part of the story, though, right? right? It's part of the. It's part of the. It's part of that authentic. And see, here I thought it was by design. I always thought it was like this is. It's, it's supposed good. to add it's to the authenticity as, of the story of the food. <laughs> it's just as good as we could do. <laughs> it's just. <laughs> but it's you know it's also kind of inspired by. Uh, some Austin brands and how Austin brands put their stores together. And it, ironically, Amy's, right? Mm -hmm. Like Amy's will be stickers everywhere and it's like rock and roll mm -hmm. for ice cream. And they're like, yeah, I like this. You know, it's a, it's a really, and the first store that we opened on Congress, that was an Amy's. That was an Amy's that I went to a couple of decades ago. Oh, or wow. yeah. yeah, that was an Amy's right across from St. Ed's there. And uh, I just, I was, you know, that was one of the things where it's like, it's all coming together. You know, this is one super respected Austin brand and we're going to move into this space. And, and uh, you know, our kind of brand vibe is very similar, you know, or like a thundercloud, you know, I mean, we want it to be casual. It's casual food, you know, we're not serving this on, we're serving this in cardboard boats, you know, it's, it's premium food, but served in a very casual setting. So. Right there's there's these you know ironic elements to our business it's like it's not cheap and it's not luxurious or even very nice in your element but it is it does have a certain feeling and it has that kind of old school austin like you're gonna know the guy that's making your food type of a feel to it you know when we've been really lucky with our staff you know we keep we keep staff on board for for quite a while and people seem to be happy you know of course that's not across the board 100 percent of the time nothing is but you know we're really lucky we have we have great staff that really focuses on service which is another thing you know i mean i don't care about the surrounding the most important thing is service honestly right. you know i mean you want to give people just the friendliest an overly friendly vibe and we strive for that we don't always hit the mark but we really strive for that because you can mess up somebody's food and the way that we make food I mean, that happens all the time because it really is a delicate thing. It's a delicate balance. Um, but you can mess up somebody's food and then remake it for them with a smile and you just kept a customer, you know? Right. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what we focus on in terms of like the vibe and the, the beachiness is, is service ultimately. That's great. Yeah. That's, a, that's important. And it's, that's, I feel like that's important not only in the, in the, not only in the service industry, but across the board oh. too across the board people are so hungry for good service when it comes to technology in particular right you know a service becomes more automated and it gets more difficult to talk to normal people for something that you depend on it's kind of baffling like mm -hmm. what do i need to do and how much do i need to pay to talk to somebody to figure right. out this problem and it you know depends on what service you're dealing with but oftentimes it'll you will get to that point where you'll get to talk to somebody and you're like ah oh, solution but yeah i think service is something that if you do it well in any sector in the economy you're going to win customers and you're going to you're going to win a lot of loyalty and people will pay extra for it that's a great point point. and you know like one of the things that kind of like popped in my head when you were speaking earlier was that you know like I mean, the food, the food is so good, right? And I'm not just, I'm not just kind of like making this entire <laughs> podcast, like just a plug for Poke Poke, but I actually genuinely love your product. Um, so, but to your point, you know, it comes in a cardboard boat, you know, and it's like, that, that's such a, that's such a beautiful concept when discussing and talking about food, right? Is that quality, you know, food takes you to somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. It takes you to an experience. It, 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 it. It, uh, you know, whether it's the smell, the taste, the, the flavor profile, or it, it takes you to a, a particular memory, right? Yep. Um, and transports you to a place. And that doesn't necessarily have to come on, you know, an extravagant, you know, China set, right? It can come in a cardboard boat. You Absolutely. Know what I mean? And I think that's also really important that, you know, to your point, you know, it is, it's not cheap, but it's premium and it's, it's, it's a, and it's authentic. I feel, I feel like it's very authentic. Right. I, you know, I think any time you can get a meal that is super casual, very quick, but you could tell 
the ingredients and and the thought that's gone into to the building of that mm -hmm. of that meal or is a little bit elevated it makes a huge impact um on that experience right you're like oh wow this is something you know like if you get a euro that is above and beyond you're just like kind of blown away i mean and it's got all the elements that that maybe you expect maybe you don't but they're in there like a pickle and like the great tiki sauce and like you know the stuff that's just like bring, elevates it um you know and in this town we're lucky to have so many great elevated tacos you mm -hmm. know like nixta like those people we've met them and they are fantastic uh and their product is just incredible right you know you're getting elevated tacos and every ingredient that goes into those tacos there's been a lot of thought and process that goes into the individual ingredients, you know, and, um, you know, it's not, it's not fancy. And, and, uh, we really, we had a fun conversation with one of the fountain with Sarah, Sarah, um, about, we were like, we really respect what you've done. You know, you flip the space, mm -hmm. you, you, you put some paint up and got it operational as soon as possible. And that is, that's, that is something to do. You know, because that's kind of how we try to operate. We'll take over a second generation space, put a little lipstick on it and try to get open and just get operational because once you're operational, you, you really start to find your audience and right. you start to find your groove. And, and um, it's, it's a fun, really challenging thing to do. And when it comes together, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's incredibly difficult if you're doing it without a lot of money, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of aspects in Austin that, that there's a lot of people that are doing the same thing that are doing these casual products that are, <clears throat> that are more elevated than normal, you know, like better half sandwiches are amazing. They're like next level. You know, there's so many, I just, I really, I really think we're, this town in particular has, has been kind of instrumental in, in our success and, and growth. Right, because of the acceptance of uh, of that kind of elevated casual feeling, mm -hmm. it almost kind of feels like Austin's kind of like in this like period, this Renaissance period, where like mm. these really fantastic dishes are coming out of of Austin, like and people are. But but also an important note is is that going back to the like there's a there's a there's a almost like a like a focus and emphasis on the authenticity of of those of those meals right sure. so like where 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 the ingredients are being sourced from where the inspiration is coming from for those particular dishes um and and making sure that you know the the customer service level is is on par yep, yep. i think that it's it's really interesting and i, I and i feel like it's only going to get better absolutely <clears throat> absolutely i mean more and more up and coming chefs, I hope, uh, target Austin to to really hone in on on a concept that they're passionate about. And I feel like mm -hmm. this is the perfect place to do it. You know, we've got it, it's all about the people that live here. You know, people in Austin are excited and 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 very curious eaters. I mean, mm -hmm. they really want to try new stuff. You know, so to get into somebody's eating habit is a little bit easier in Austin. So. Um, you know, that's, that's a great point. Yeah. And I think that's why up and coming chefs will target a market like this mm -hmm. because, um, because of the curiosity level, you know, people want to try new things. I mean, you go to restaurant openings or a newer newish restaurant, you can't get in for six months. You know, it's brutal, but it's great for the restaurants. It's great for the chefs. Um, and diners are, are just, and you know, it is also a fact that Austin has a higher, you know, income rate than, than right. most cities. So uh, it's it's becoming a real hot spot. You know, like we couldn't expand in Los Angeles. Right. You know, we couldn't even consider it because we have never t taken on any large amount of investment. And we weren't interested in that. So Austin for us was a perfect market, mm -hmm. you know. Because of the availability of spaces and more so because the people here were, we knew that they would be accepting 
of uh, the product, you know. And we've also experienced the opposite. Say, you know, we opened a store in Fort Worth, and it has taken a long time to build up an audience in Fort Worth. Now we have a super great regular base of people there, mm -hmm. but Fort Worth is a different city with completely different food habits. How many locations do you have now? Uh, four total. Yeah, four. Okay. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Um. Well, it's no. I mean, it's no surprise that you guys are expanding, man, because because everything is primo. Lo love you guys. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is. Uh, I'm gonna float around the rest of the day with my massive inflated head. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, man. Anytime you need a hype, man, I got you. I got you. <laughs> Um, I appreciate it. You know, one of the things that you, you mentioned earlier in our conversation or kind of like our pre podcast conversation was the fact that you, um, you know, you said, uh, you know, that you had some, uh, 4th of July plans and yeah. that you were going to be hanging out with, uh, you guys are going to be making poke uh -huh. and you guys, and you're going to be hanging out with, uh, like two other, like really big names in the chef in the, in the food scene, right? Sure. The actual true chefs. And you were like, Oh, but I'm not like a real chef. Like, do you like, like, do you, cause I mean, first and foremost, you're, you're kind of like a, like you're a business, you know, you're a business guy. You are an entrepreneur that really enjoys great food and providing great experiences. Right. Sure. So, yeah. and, and you, I mean, do you kind of like see yourself as kind of like not within the chef category, but, but also, but I mean, how do you kind of like, I don't know. How do you kind of like, it's, fit in with that with that community exactly it's, it's it's odd i mean we really don't you know i i wouldn't say we don't fit in but you know we go to austin food and wine we're invited uh just about every year we just got invited to be at 2022 and i love that event and it's a great it's a great opportunity to meet other chefs and we do get you know we get kudos from other chefs like i love your product but you know these people have put so much time into a lot of their into their concepts into their restaurants and into their food and we have too we've obviously put you know probably just as much just as much time in but it's just a different thing like say a chef that's running a full service restaurant and you know they've got a 50 person staff at in one store and it's a full-time thing just mm -hmm. keeping you know, the prep that starts at seven in the morning going just for dinner service, you know, it's just a different kind of operation. And, <laughs> you know, it's, I, there are moments where it doesn't feel like my wife and I, it doesn't feel like we really click in with that. Mm -hmm. um, because for us, it really is like, yes, we focus on the product, but our product scope is very narrow right so we don't you know we don't have to know how to make all of these other elements of things we make this one thing we try to do it really well we do quick service we focus on keeping costs down because our operation is tiny you know but we don't do gangbusters numbers every day either mm -hmm. you know like you see some of these in any any full service chef driven restaurant in austin you know they might do twenty thousand dollars a day we do a fraction of that right you know so it's just a totally different thing um but we do get we we get you know i mean i met tim love last year it was his birthday and he was like oh we get your food in fort worth all the time and it was like this crazy thing you know he's a big part of the austin food and wine fest mm -hmm. uh and you know yeah we've we, we get to meet other chefs and uh, some some we have, my wife has been friends with, with one of the chefs that we're going to be with uh, this weekend. She's been friends with, they've been friends forever. And so she's introduced us to a lot of people. And they're all super, like the community overall is amazing. Um, very kind people. They all share experiences and their knowledge with each other within the community to anybody who... <laughs> Who's interested? Really, they're they're very sharing, giving uh, community. Um, but you know, we are kind of in a different space, right? Ultimately, um, and so you know, we don't expect to be like super accepted, and and uh, but we are accepted enough, right? Plenty. You know, it's an odd thing to talk about, but it's you know, yeah. 
Well, and I feel like, I feel like if, you know, because like other, other, you know, even, even a lot of food trucks have chefs at the helm, right? Like oh, yeah. they've graduated from, you know, Le Cordon Bleu or, or whatever it is, you know, from culinary school. But I think what makes you guys that separates you guys apart from from other places that are kind of like business first is because the food is just that good. Mm. It's it's very it's you know, it's it's super fresh. It's like I mean, I, I got to be honest, like I prefer to go to Poke Poke even above some of the some of the other like sushi, like like legit sushi places in town just because it's so good. It's so fresh and so flavorful. Uh, I, you know what I mean? I, I definitely appreciate that. And, you know, I mean, that's kind of how we position ourselves in the market. You know, it's like, yeah, eat sushi, but occasionally also eat poke, give your, you know, give your wallet a break. Yeah. Um, and it's a just very on point kind of and your apples palate. to apples uh, comparison. Yeah. And the, yeah, and I, I appreciate you with uh, with the comments about the food and the because it really is it's like a delicate balance and and again, we're lucky to have a staff that that puts thought into all the poke that they make because they're all pretty engaged in in um, delivering that experience and and they know they know they see the difference when people are really blown away by the food so. Um, it's uh you know we're in a good space i mean i don't i wouldn't trade it for anything right now i'm we're really enjoying it um yeah we're we're really having a good time i mean it's crazy challenging and there's no you know it's right now it's my wife she's kind of my support system and then i support the stores directly you know we don't have mm -hmm. any executive in between it's just myself and the gms Right. And then staff. So it's a pretty flat organization. Everybody's, I know everybody. And That's great. Kinda, That's the way it should be. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's a lot of fun, you know? Yeah. Well, we are coming up on time here. Okay. Um, is there anything, like, what do you want, what do you want people to know about, uh, about your establishment? <laughs> and, I usually don't talk this much. And what's That's next? That's what I want people to know. What's next? <laughs> Well, that's that's a good question. We are cautiously exploring maybe another space. Um, we're thinking about introducing some new elements. I mean, when we first opened in Austin, if anybody came to the shop, they would have remembered we were doing shave ice for a minute mm -hmm. with homemade syrups. Uh, we have gotten our shave ice machine back into our garage, and we are contemplating doing something with it. Um, so we we've got some maybe some new elements that that we might be exploring in the immediate future yeah that's great yeah cool yes sir well, jason it's been great talking to you thank you so much for joining us thanks for having me what a this good has time been a lot of fun and uh yeah so you heard it here we got it straight on salami get this straight <laughs> um yeah, if you haven't already, uh, you know I know that I've been hyping hyping Poke Poke up a ton during this during this uh, during this podcast. But uh, if you haven't had the you know their food yet, you gotta head on over there. And as always, we will be continuing this conversation on Ibble, so make sure and check it out. Download the app, uh, take a look, and uh, and uh, if you have any additional questions for Jason. You can hit him up on Ibble, and um, and uh, he'll be able to to answer you back. Hit me up. There you go. Salami, get this straight.